Great. So I'm going to consider a win to this whole presentation a win today if I don't fall. I'm going to confess to you that a few years ago I facilitated a course and I was, I was behind a kind of a podium like this and they had a bunch of cords and I went to take a step and the cord hooked my high heels and I, I literally face planted. It was one of the most graceful moments of my life. Uh, but I will tell you I had a plan in place because I have had this fear my entire life and I had decided if I ever fell that I would jump up like the Olympics and throw my hands in the air and yell 10. And I did. Like that, that was the only thing that went through my mind. And I don't know if it was a brilliant idea or a really poor idea. Half of the people that were watching this thought that I had planned it, which I don't know why you would plan such a thing. And the other half thought it was a brilliant recovery. Either way, we're just gonna hope that I, that I don't biff it today. So you'll see that I have labeled the talk today, or, or this presentation, the buddy system, undercurrents, and dead rats, critical tools for businesses and leaders. And as part of this, I really want to hit for you five golden nuggets that I really feel are important. And also, I want to make your job very easy as students. Don't worry, this will come up again at the very end on the last slide. So if you don't get that, get it quite uh, now, that's OK. You'll get another chance to see it in the future. So here's my, oh, and nuggets is, uh, I'll correct that spelling. OK, so um, support yourself is my first thing that I want to talk about. The second one is embracing the humanity of business. And that's a big topic that we're going to hit today. The third one is expanding your perspective. The fourth is look for single solutions. And the fifth is get real and get real about you. Now, my brother and I had a conversation the other day. He works for an international, uh, I, I don't know what they do, but there's, they make things that blow things up. So, but I don't think he does. He just goes to places like Greece and Korea. And he said to me the other day, he said, how did I get where I, where I am now? And he just, he looks back sometimes and I laughed because I thought, I really understand that. And this, this comment really resonates with me that life and careers often take unexpected turns and it's awesome. So here's some things that I can tell you. I am deathly afraid of sharks and I am scuba certified. I really, really do not like heights, and I have jumped out of an airplane. When I was 18, I was getting ready to go to college, and I thought, oh, I know how life turns out. You go to BYU, and then you get married, and then you have a family, and I, honestly, I actually didn't even think I would graduate with a bachelor's degree, and I, I wasn't even thinking like there was anything in my head. I was just like, well, you just go to college, and then you have a family, and, and that's what happens. And I never dreamed that I would be here today as a small business owner. My life has been entirely different than what I expected. Uh, so this was actually about 20 years ago when I graduated from high school. Do not do the math, please. It'll feel better if you don't. Uh, but I, I went to a career counselor and my mom had found this lady who does these tests, or actually it was a gentleman, and he's really good at what he does. And he, I went in for the results session and he looked at me and he said, Emily, you would be really great in leadership or some type of role where you own your own business. And I kind of laughed about it. I was just like, okay, whatever, that's fine. Uh, and then I went to school and, and life changed and it wasn't what I thought it would be. And I just kept making what I felt was the best decision that I could make. And I went to school and I got all sorts of great learning under my belt and then I graduated and then I realized I know nothing, this degree didn't prepare me, I have no idea what's going on and I got a job and I just kept gaining experience until I got to the point that I had consulting companies that wanted to reach out to me that said, hey, we really like what you do and we think you can help us. And at some point I came to a realization that the company I worked for and the team, the direction they were headed down was not the direction I wanted to go down. I wanted to be headed this way and they were going that way. And if I went this way, there wasn't anyone around in the local area to hire me. So I had one choice, which was to remember what someone had told me almost 20 years ago and open my own business. So I'm going to talk with you about some lessons that I've learned that I think would be really helpful and I, um, I hope that it will provide some perspective for you. Here's something else that I didn't realize. So I, I specialized in, uh, in leadership and it was a great topic and I loved it. You read about Gandhi and you read about Abraham Lincoln and you're reading about Mother Teresa and I'm telling you, you read these books and it feels great. You read good to great and you think, I've got this. Here's what I didn't expect. Leadership is incredibly lonely. Sometimes you have to fire your friends. And I'm telling you, 
You do not know how that feels until you are looking at the person and you know they want that job and they need that job for health care and you know you cannot keep them employed. You have no idea how that feels until you are standing in that spot. You have no idea how hard leadership will be and in terms of work-life balance until you come to the point that a gentleman that I, I spoke with uh, a few months ago, and, and I'm just going to share this, this conversation with you because I think it's such a great example. I went in to talk with him. And as we were meeting, I asked him, I said, what, what is it that you really want to accomplish? And he sat there for a moment, just paused, and he said, Emily, you know what I really want? I want to provide a good life for my family. I, I love my kids, and I want them to have this great life. And I said, well, how's it going? And you know what he said to me? He said, I'm really struggling. And you know, this is why he said he was struggling. He said, this job demands so much of me. It demands so, so much. And I'm gone so much. But I know this job is providing that life that my kids want to have. But here's the problem. The problem is, I'm afraid I'm missing out on the best moments of my kid's life. And I'm afraid they're missing out on having a dad in their life. It's real. This is, I hear these things from leaders all the time. There's constant market pressure. And if you are thinking about owning your own business, let me tell you, you get your own special brand of stresses. There are all sorts. If you Google the, the phrase, the psychological cost of entrepreneurship, you will find all sorts of articles that talk about from people who are like, I was so depressed. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how I was going to find clients. I couldn't sleep. I was gaining weight. And it's, it's hard. It's really, really hard. And my goal today um, is, first of all, to say, like, hey, this is real. It happens in leadership. But well prepared and with a good head on your shoulders, it does not have to be as hard. This is one of my favorite quotes that's going to come up. Whenever I start feeling lonely, I just stop being lonely and start being awesome instead. Uh, I, I love this because <laughs> this is the reality of being in leadership and owning a business. Everybody expects you to be on your A-game, right? You've got people who are looking to you. They want you to be making split-second decisions. And it's like, you got to go. you got to go fast. And sometimes the reality is you as a leader are not sure what to do. You've never been in this spot before. The situation is complicated. And what I'm going to tell you is you need for 10 minutes to say, I'm going to be awesome, and I'm going to believe in myself. And I need you to silence the doubt in your mind. And instead of listening to the doubt, I want you to be awesome for five minutes, and then another 10, and then another 20. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. At the end of the day, you are going to be able to look at things and say, hey, you know what? I had three awesome hours today. You may also have to look back and laughingly say, and then there was that 10 minutes that I really, really blew it. But if you will learn to put one foot in front of the other, if you will learn to listen to the more confident side of you, the side of you that knows everything is going to work out, the side of you that says, I've got this. I have wisdom. I've learned. I'm in this job for a reason. If you will learn to listen to that voice instead of the voice that says you can't do this, or you're a woman, or you don't have experience, things will be OK. So listen to that voice. And let me tell you how else you can do this. You build a support network. They say that leadership is lonely, and I'm going to tell you that it is, but it doesn't have to be so bad. You've got plenty of things here, uh, items here. For those who are watching on the broadcast, for leaders, there are mentors, coaches, fa family members, colleagues. There's professional associations. When you get to the point that you're in a C-suite level job, and you're working for a company that makes a couple million dollars a year, you can join a group called Vistage. I'm not being paid by Vistage to talk about this, PS. I have no stocks with them. But it's a place where C-suite executives can get together and say, hey, this is what's going on. What do you think? And they work together to support each other. I want to specifically talk to you about your families. Your families are going to have a relationship with your job. How many of you, by raise of hand, have thought about the relationship you want your families to have with your job? We've got a couple of you. For those of you who haven't raised your hand, I want you to think about that and really, really think about it. Because how you come home from your job affects your family. And 
I, you know, I was just talking with an entrepreneur about this and we were talking, he said, what do you do? And I said, well, what I do is I help leaders really get the crud out of their head, think about things in clear ways, and really I enable them to make great decisions, but not on their own, because it is never so hard to be a leader as when you are laying people off or having kind of these tough things happening that we've already talked about. And he said, oh my gosh, I really resonate that. And as we talked, one of the things we discussed is when things aren't going well in your business, Here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to go home and say, hi, sweetheart. I just want to tell you, I think the business is going under. Because where did her stress levels go to? Through the roof. Even if his, hers, whoever, whoever is in your life, stress levels go through the roof. And so you need to decide very carefully and mindfully design with the people in your life what they want to know and what is the best way to interact with them. Mentors and coaches, I'm going to bring these up in particular. Mentors, people who have been through the process and will give you advice. Coaches are different. Coaches are there, and, and I'm there as a coach to stretch you, to challenge you, to help you think of things in a different way. But I'm not going to tell you this is how you have to do it. If I'm telling you this is how I, you have to do it, that's a consultant. Entrepreneurs, uh, here's something that I wish that I had known. I would have started my business years ago if I had known how much help I was going to have. Look up SCORE online. They provide free help and will help you put together a business plan. They will teach you how to do marketing if you don't know how to do marketing. They'll talk with you about websites. Everything you need is there for free. The Women's Business Center locally, guess what? 20% of their clients are men because they cannot discriminate, which means if you have questions about starting up your business or knowing what kind of codes you need to assign for government purposes, they help you, man or woman. Get in there, go do it, it's free. As part of this, I will also say, if I had known there was this much help and that I could just work on this on the side, I probably would have started opening my business before I left my last job. It's not expensive. If you have something in mind, you can start working on it today. Okay, here's the other reason that uh, leadership is a little bit lonely. I've talked with you already about how people say to leaders, you want to be on your A game, right? You've got to be doing everything perfectly. And here's the reality. I do not know a single person who is perfect. Not one. In fact, the leaders that I know who have made the best growth and the ones that I've worked with who really escalate and do well are the ones who can humbly say, I am not perfect. I want you to take a look at this list. These are the areas where CEOs are getting coached in. And this uh, is an executive coaching survey from Stanford University and the Miles Group. As I read this list, I want you to think about, would it be helpful for you personally to have better skills in these areas? Delegation. Conflict management. Developing internal talent. Helping other people who are coming up in the ranks behind you. Team building. In other words, dealing with dysfunctional teams and knowing how to grow strong ones. Listening skills. Communication skills. Planning skills. Interpersonal skills. Persuasion skills. Compassion skills. And motivation skills. As a side note, I laugh about compassion skills because I'm just going to give you a heads up. It's true, people don't like working for jerks. So I recommend being, <laughs> be nice. People will want to work for you. But these are the areas. And you'll notice that there's nothing on this list here that says, oh, I don't know how to do marketing. I don't know how to do finance. Oh, you know what I don't know how to do? Work with Excel. You're going to learn those things in your classes. I have somebody that I really look up to who lives locally. He's 28 years old, and he has 16 companies. They're all tech companies, and what he does is he develops projects, and once it hits that project, earns $250,000 revenue, he, he turns that into a business. Now, let me tell you what makes this gentleman stand apart. When he was 18, he took a look at a list like this, or I'm presuming it was a list like this, and he said, you know what, I want to know what motivates people. And he devoted himself to learning about the people side of things. And because of that, he has been able to structure his companies very strategically and in a way that people want to be working for him. He's figured out that when you want to be successful in life, you have to be able to do two things. You have to be able to manage so those are the skills you're, you're taking in your classes right now, how to do all of that finance, how to do all of the marketing, but you also have to be able to lead. And leadership is about the being side of you. It's not the doing side, it's the being side. 
if you will recognize that everybody, <laughs> all of these CEOs have the same goals, you can know the following. It's okay not to be perfect. So here's what I would say kind of in sum about this point. Create your support team. Don't go into this alone, you don't have to. Mindfully construct those relationships. Think about intentionally what you want those relationships to look like. And number three, give yourself a break. You are in good company. And I can't tell you how many leaders I talk to who are just relieved when they find out, oh my gosh, other people, other leaders, other CEOs aren't perfect. It's a relief, so cut yourself a break. Point number two, I'm calling it, learn to work with undercurrents. I could have titled this something else, which is this. Surprise, you're not a robot. Uh, when we talk about business lately, how many of you have, have heard conversations about the role of emotion in business, just by raise of hand? We have very few hands up here. And a lot of people don't want emotion to be involved. But I'm gonna give you a hint. Emotions are everywhere in business and you can learn to use them to your advantage. Emotion sells, right? That's, what, that's why people are buying things, because they feel an emotional connection. And all of these things that we're talking about, all these challenges that people have, what keeps leaders up at night, if you don't think there's emotion involved, you'd be surprised. You see it all the time with politics. You see it with employee engagement. How do people want to come to work? Do they want to show up? Whether or not you want to admit it, there are undercurrents of emotion running through your business because your business hires people, not robots. Let's talk quickly about what undercurrents are and very, very quickly. Undercurrents are a natural part of oceans. They keep them healthy. They get nutrients going, they restore uh, the temperature, and in all honesty, they can be all levels of speed. They can be fast, they can be slow. The same is true in business. Uh, whether it's agendas, whether it's emotions, they are there. And they can be very good for you. Conflict is a great example. Conflict is one of those emotions that if you see it going under the surface, it's great to look at. And I'm going to give you an example right now. Actually, let me finish off this, this uh, PowerPoint. Um, you, you can fight against the current. And if you fight, uh, do I have any other scuba divers in here? Okay. Do you know what the bends are? Can you, can you tell people? I'm really happy for you that you don't know what the bends are. Uh, in very simple terms, it's a release of, of gases in your body and it's very dangerous. And that is one of the complications that can happen. You can get joint pains, rashes, it can even be fatal because some of that, some of that can go into your brain. Not something you want to have happen, right? You can also get totally exhausted, you can drown. Now how do you escape it? You escape it by changing direction. If you're scuba diving, you drop your weight so that you can shoot up and get above and get out of it so you can see what's below you. You can also swim parallel to the shore, so you start going in opposite direction. But you have to recognize that it's there in order to take that path. And then you can, here's one of the things, avoid struggling. Don't fight it. And I'm gonna tell you that, that if you wanna fight against emotion, if you wanna pretend it's not there, big things happen. And this is a great example from Stephen R. Covey. So Stephen R. So Covey and Franklin, so uh, let's see here. Franklin Quest and Covey Leadership Forum combined become Franklin Covey. Has any of you heard of Franklin Covey? Some pretty good hands here, okay. So when they combined the company, the new CEO basically said, okay, we need to know how people are feeling. You can have a meeting, and in this meeting where you can talk about things, uh, you are not allowed to amend, correct, give context, supply missing information, discuss the other side of the issues, or show any other dilemmas involved. So you're not to talk about anything that's really going on. They went through about 12 meetings like this, and as you can imagine, it was going terribly. And finally, Stephen Archive was like, ah, screw it. There's gotta be something that's gonna happen, and how bad could it be? So this is what he says. I walked into the consultant meeting that day in Washington, D.C., and I basically, basically said, look, we're at this meeting to talk about strategy, and if that's what you want to talk about, then we'll talk about that. But if you would rather talk about the merger issues that are really on your minds, we'll talk about those. We'll talk about any of the tough questions you have. Who's staying and who's going? Who's making what decisions? What criteria are being used? Why aren't we more informed? What if we don't trust those making the decisions? What if we don't trust you, Stephen, to make some of those decisions? 
At first, people were stunned that he would bring up the difficult issues, including their perception of him. Many were also wondering what his real agenda was, but they soon realized that he wasn't hiding anything. He was being transparent and candid. As the meeting progressed, they could see he wasn't operating from a hidden agenda, all of those things going on below the surface. At the end of the day, there was a renewed feeling of hope and excitement. One participant told me I had established more trust in one day than I had in the prior several months. So by fighting that current, they were really hurting the company. And that's why I tell you, you've got to acknowledge what's going on under the water. We talked a little bit about this, what's going on under that business. You have agendas, you have emotions. There's all sorts of things that don't get discussed in business. My tip for you today is don't run away from it. Acknowledge it, learn to use it, learn to listen for it. I love this quote from Simon Sinek. Truly human leadership protects an organization from the internal rivalries that can shatter a culture. When we have to protect ourselves from each other, the whole organization suffers. But when trust and cooperation thrive internally, we pull together and the organization grows stronger as a result. In order to have trust, in order for things to go well, you've got to talk about what's under the surface. And so how do we do that? Uh, as a and Oh, okay. I'm going to bring this up really quickly. So employee engagement. This is just another slide about why we care. Employee engagement is one of those deeper rooted feelings that people have. It's about do you want to come to work or not? And let me tell you, this is why, another reason why I think we care. For people who have very low employee, or companies with very low employee engagement, I'm going to draw your attention just to here because you can read the slides later. 10% decrease in customer ratings, 22% decrease in profitability, 21% decrease in productivity. You've got to be paying attention to what's going on under the surface. How happy are your employees? Do they want to be there? Do they not? And why? What's going on? How do we do this? How do we spot the undercurrents? And I would tell you it comes down to three things. Number one, you need to learn about people and systems. What makes them tick? You probably will have one class on organization behavior, something along those lines, but I'm telling you, like this gentleman who's 28 years old here in Salt Lake, who has devoted himself to understanding people, it has been to his benefit. Figure out what makes people tick, and figure out what makes you tick. Learn to look. Know where to look for things, such as in conversations, assessments. There's companies that do employee engagement assessments. You can do things like that, but know how to look. And then number three is learn how to listen. Listen to more than the words. Is somebody concerned about the actual content, or are they concerned about how they're being treated? Let's get into this a little bit more. So. What can you expect from people when change happens? And why do I choose change? Well, change is one of these big topics that people discuss frequently because change happens to, f these change initiatives fail so frequently in businesses. As it turns out, when I told you that you had hired people, not robots, it's true. And when people go through change, they experience the grief cycle, denial, denial anger, depression, bargaining, and finally acceptance. The University of Utah hospital system recently, in the last few years, switched from paper records to electronic records. Now, some of the doctors were using electronic records prior to that. As I was working with them, and I worked internally for them at the time, I had done some research on what we could expect from the doctors. And it turns out, they've done all of these studies, and they found that these doctors were going through the grief cycle, transitioning from paper records to electronic. And you will see that. So a lot of times when I'm talking with leaders and they're like, I made this change and people are frustrated. Why didn't they just accept it? And you know what my answer is? Because you didn't hire robots. It's not going to happen every time, but just anticipate that as people go through change, there are some things that they are going to experience. What else can you learn about people? This is another one about change. Daniel Rock is a neurologist who has looked at neurology as it relates to business. And he has found that there are five reasons that people resist change. How many of you just, and, and I'd love all of you to think of a situation where you experienced a major change in your life and think about how you felt. Please raise your hand and keep it up when you have thought of that scenario. A major change in your life that you struggled with. And I'm going to wait till everyone has something in mind and has a hand up in the air. Okay. Think about that scenario. And as you think about that scenario, I want you to think about why that change was hard for you. Okay? 
Here's the five reasons he says that change is hard for people as he's studied the neurology behind it. He says, number one, there's a question of status. Someone's questioning my status by making that change. Someone's questioning if I'm smart enough or if I'm good enough. Number two, certainty, meaning a change was made and all of a sudden your life is incredibly uncertain. You are standing on very shaky ground. Number three, autonomy. And I wanna talk about autonomy and relatedness together because they're, they're similar but but different enough that they've been separated. Autonomy is, I got to make that choice. I should have been able to make that choice. And some of you may be looking at this and saying, how come I didn't get to make that choice? Now separate from that is relatedness. And relatedness is this. You didn't include me when I made the choice. I wanted to be part of that team. I thought I was part of that. I thought I was part of the club and you didn't count me in. And I'm important, I matter, my voice matters and you didn't listen. Do you get the difference there? One is, I want to make the choice. The other one is, I got excluded. Number five, fairness. It's not fair. By raise of hand, how many of you experienced one of these with that major change? Most of you. So that experience you've had is really important. I want you to remember what just happened here. Because what you just experienced is what other people are going to experience in business when you take away PTO or when you decide that you're gonna change the work hours. They're gonna have experiences like this and you can anticipate it. Study Daniel Rock, this, I've put the scarf model here, you can look him up online. He has tips for you on how to respond and how to identify why people feel threatened. It will be helpful to you. Learn, learn about people, learn about how to respond and it will be helpful. Now where do we look? And we've already talked about this. It looks like this slide isn't coming up quite cleanly. Uh, You've gotta know where to look for these things. One of them is in communication, you can have assessments. There's five levels of communication. The first one is, hello and how are you doing? They're just very cliche comments. The second is the exchange of information. And we see this all the time in business. You are giving somebody an update, you're telling somebody how their things are going, but it's just this one-way communication. You might also see this in annual presentations. The third level is where you're exchanging ideas and opinions, meaning, I don't like that idea, I don't think our strategy should be that, or, you know, I don't think this is a good shift that we should make for our company. You'll see that in business meetings, you'll see it in team meetings, you'll see it in project meetings. Level four is where people actually talk about feelings, and this is where I love to reference the meeting after the meeting. How many of you have ever heard of the meeting after the meeting? A few of you. Here's what happens. I've just had a meeting and we've talked about things, and then three of you walk out and you say this, oh my gosh, that's such a dumb idea. Why are we talking about it this way? Why is that going on? Or they do this, you know what, that was so unproductive. Okay, let's really do this. And they shift things. It's the meeting after the meeting, they happen all the time, especially if things are not being managed productively. Uh, but you start getting a sense for what's going on underneath. And level five is gut deep level feelings, and this is where you get into employee engagement, why people really feel the way they do. Learn to listen below the surface. How do you listen below the surface? Uh, I'm gonna give you some examples and I'm gonna start with team dynamics. We probably won't have time to get into all of these because I wanna cover some other topics with you. But one of them, um, well, I'll just, I'll just start with the example and I think it will flesh things out for you. I worked with a team that was pulled together from various parts of the organization and also s included some people who were brought in externally. And what happened is one of the leaders who had worked internally to the company became very disliked by some of the people who had, brought in, who had come in externally. They knew a little bit of her history with the company, they decided it wasn't working well, and there became a lot of friction. Well, a few months into this process, and things were not going well at all for this team, a new person was hired and he came in from the outside. And instead of just jumping on board and saying, yeah, this leader's a tool, he asked himself a question. What's going on for this person and what is driving their behavior? What is it they really want? And you know what he said? He said, I think this leader doesn't feel respected or appreciated. And this leader is actually doing a lot for this team. This leader is bending over backwards. And so you know what he did? This is really hard. He expressed appreciation. And he's just started doing that. And very quickly, 
they suddenly had a great working relationship. In fact, this particular person has been assigned all of the difficult people to work with because he listens to what it is that they really need. He's paying attention. And over time, the other people on the team began to take notice of this. And they began to learn that they needed to extend appreciation. Now, I'm not going to point fingers and say who did what first. It doesn't matter. If you are a leader, you are the first one to step up to address it. You are the one who begins to ask the question, what's under that emotion? What's going on underneath? And what that you value is being stepped on. It's important for you to understand this as well. Um, I, and, and I'm going to give delegation as an example. If I'm working with a leader and they're having a hard time delegating, for me the question becomes, what's going on underneath the situation that makes you not want to delegate? And there's a couple different ways they could answer. One of which is someone could say, you know, the truth of the matter is all of my executives are so strapped for time and they are so overwhelmed and this project is so big that I can't hand it over to them. I'm really worried about them and I also know the buck stops here. I don't feel like I can delegate. And we may sit down and have further conversation about that. And at the end of the conversation, you know what may happen? That leader may say, you know what? I'm not delegating this, and it is a great choice for me, but I need to balance this. I can't keep doing this for longer than two months because I also need to respect my family. That situation can also go very differently. And it could be that I say to someone, tell me what's going on under this, this delegation issue. You know what they might say to me? You know what, Johnny? is the one who would oversee this particular project, and he has been late seven times. So I might say to him, okay, so he's been late seven times, that doesn't explain to me why you're not delegating yet. Have you not dealt with the issue? And you know what he might say to me? That leader may say, you know what, here's the thing, I don't really wanna have the conversation. They would rather not delegate than have the conversation, but if you know that that's the issue, if you know that's what's going on, then as a leader you begin, can begin to start really facing the demons that are holding your business back. Because the reality is, if that's what's holding you back, there's probably other people who could do that job and do it well. You don't have to keep yourself from delegating, but you need to be able to reflect back to yourself and say, what do you value? You value performance, you value things being on time. If you are frustrated, you've gotta be able to acknowledge it and deal with it, and then you will be able to move forward. Okay, key takeaways. I want you to embrace and learn about the human side of business. This does not mean that you should address human issues at midnight through an email. That's a bad choice, guys, just as a heads up. It doesn't mean that in a very heated moment you suddenly turn to someone and say, ah, oh, you're such a jerk. Those are typically not good ways to do it, but I want you to understand you are working with people. Learn about them, look for it know where to look for it, and then learn to listen for it. Just so keep your eyes and your ears wide open. Here's my third tip for you. Expand your perspective, and I have written out, try dead rats. Why do I have this here? Because when you work in business, people will come to you and they will have a very uh, subtle, or a very, y you can have covert, or you can have overt uh, agendas. And the best thing you can do as a leader is be able to think of things outside of the box. Google did this. When Google set up their company, all of their competitors were looking at things and, and they would just make look like were this huge gateway to the internet. There's actually a TED talk about this. It's really fantastic. What, what this gentleman says is that Google realized that people trust uh, experts who are expert in one thing. So he gives an example of a combo DVD TV player. And you look at the combo TV DVD player and what do you say? The TV's probably okay, the DVD player probably isn't great, right? Instead, we all go out and we buy the amazing TV from the brand that we love, and then we go buy to another company and we buy a separate sound system because, yeah, that sound system's amazing. We look for the people who are experts, and so Google chose to become an expert at what they did, and that is why they have done really well, but they had to think outside of the box. Now, how do you do this? What I want you to know is that you can choose your perspective intentionally, and it is important to do so. How we think about a situation drives our behavior, right? 
what I want you to know is that you can choose perspectives based on what you want to achieve. So here's an example, people issues in business. Sometimes we look at people issues and people not getting along and we just say that guy's a jerk or that person's impossible to work with. Expand your mind. When I am working with teams and they have team problems, the first place I look is never the people. I look at it from a larger perspective. If goals and the vision are unclear, you are going to have people who are running all over the place and that will naturally bring people into conflict. But whose fault is that? Where does the buck stop? It stops with the leader. Sometimes you've got to give people a clear perspective and if you can give them a clear perspective, they all get on board together. Sometimes roles and responsibilities are poorly designed and actually the way that they're designed bring people into conflict and have them doing things in ways that don't work well together. And are they jerks? No, they're just trying to do their job well. But they may look at the other person and say, why are you doing it this way, bud? Right? It could be that you have processes that don't work well or maybe you're measuring things and what you're measuring isn't really what you want to measure so you're telling someone for their performance review you've got to make sure this happens you're telling the other person you've got to make sure this happens and it's in conflict and so when you look at these people and you say there's a problem expand your mind and I would tell you that the same thing is true for, uh, for business and even for problem solving. So a quick example, I worked with a client who was opening up his business and really struggling to uh, basically to get, to get any clients. He, he just felt stuck. He didn't know how to move forward. And so we took a very unique approach. This will not work for everybody, but for him it was, it was helpful. Uh, so we basically said, you don't have other people who are counseling you, so what are some other perspectives we can take? He was a foodie. So I said, okay, Let's talk about food. Tell me what your favorite food is. And he said, it's bread. I love bread. And I said, OK. So from the perspective of love and something that you love, what would you tell me about finding new clients? And he sat there for a moment and he said, you know what? I think I've forgotten how much I love clients. I love what I do. And you saw him start getting out of this spot where he was just stuck. And all of a sudden, you saw this lightness that was there. And, I said, and so we talked about that for a little bit. And then I said, well, let's shift a little bit. And so we moved and I said, tell me what your favorite season of the year is. And he said, it's autumn. I love autumn. And I said, tell me why. Why is autumn your favorite time of year? And he said, you know what? It just means the time is passing. Summer's over. And I said, OK, so let's look at finding clients from the perspective of time passing. And you saw him just kind of step back for a minute. And it was this realization that he was not doing things. He was not doing things that were going to help the business. And he knew that time was passing, helpful time. So we did one more, and this is my favorite because it's so uh, funny <laughs> in a way. And I said, okay, dead rat. Tell me what you think about dead rats. And he said, well, they probably starve to death. Remember, this is coming from a foodie. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's look at the perspective of finding clients, uh, or let's look at finding clients from the perspective of starving to death. What comes to mind? And he said, you know what? My business is going to die if I don't feed it clients. So we walked back and we went through this whole perspective. We went to the situation where he felt stuck. We reviewed how helpful it was, how light he felt when he thought about how much he loved working with clients. We looked at this concept of time passing, nothing happening, just kind of sitting there. And then we went back to this spot where he realized his business was dying. And I asked him, I said, what is the most helpful perspective for you? And you know what he said? dead rat. He was, he was like, I cannot believe I'm picking a dead rat perspective on my business. But you know what? Within a week, he was moving forward. And he just had to get out of his head. Now, that's a different way to get perspective. But I would encourage you to think about the value of thinking of things in different ways, not so black and white. Does this approach work for you? Maybe not. But you've got to find a way to think of things in different perspectives. So key takeaways from this. Think outside the box. Intentionally choose your perspective. That's really what happened with this client. He had been sitting there feeling stuck, and he didn't know how to think of it. And we looked at it from different angles, but he picked the one that would be most helpful for him based on his goals. We can think of things in the same way. Uh, someone may look at, um, you're all young, so I'm going to use a dating an analogy. Someone may look at dating someone and say, oh, this is just a waste of my time, right? Another person is going to say, hey, dating person, I'm learning some things about myself and about what I'm looking for.
Those two people will come away having learned very different things and having behaved in very different ways. So I encourage you to think about what is the intention that will help you the most for your long-term goals. Lastly, use your resources, have fun with it. I use a coach myself, the best coaches do because it's important to have people who you can talk to and think through things and get different angles. Going back to that very first lesson about really figuring out who you want on your team, they can help you find perspective. Find those people. And just to wrap things up really quick, I want you to get real about yourself. Here's a gut check for you. Some of you want to go into business for yourself. And I have a question. Do you have a brilliant idea? If you have a brilliant idea, and you have lots of ideas, you are not ready yet. We just talked about this example with Google, how they had found that one idea that they were really good with. Uh, that's, this is important. If you have too many ideas, it's going to be really hard for you to sell your business. So find the one idea. If you do have that single idea, you may be ready to consider it. Stepping apart from that, let's say you want to provide a service. So I'm in more of like a service type of work. And there's two questions. Do you have the knowledge, the skills, and experience to do that job? If you do, you might want to look into it. If you don't, go get that experience. Find a way to get it. And my closing tip associated with this is that you have at this school a career counseling, counseling center that offers an exam. Uh, and it's called the Strong Interest Inventory. This assessment has been tested over and over and over and over to make sure that when you take it now, it'll still be accurate years from now. Let me tell you how many clients I have worked with. And there has been a pretty good number that have gone to school, finished their degree, only to discover, I don't like this. Go learn about yourself. The test is $25. Look at the results, think about what you like, think about what you don't like, figure out what you're good at. If you're not good at planning, if you're not good at details, if you don't like being outdoors, own it. Figure it out now. Because I can tell you from the perspective of a friend who got a $100,000 master's degree and came out and decided to do something totally different that was skills and trade related, they would have loved that $100,000 back. You have so many resources available for you. Research yourself, know yourself. It will be one of the best gifts you can give. And with that, these, this is a review of the five golden nuggets. Support yourself, embrace the humanity of business, expand your perspective, make sure that you have a single solution to something. Of course, we have talked about that in this last area, and then get real about you. I'm a little dense sometimes. Sometimes I don't catch on to things. This is, this is actually real. A few months ago, I was thinking about my business, and I was like, this is so crazy. What, where did I even come up with this idea? And it, it dawned on me that both of my grandfathers had opened their own businesses and owned them. My dad had his own business. My mom had her, her own business. And when my grandmother was 72, she went back to graduate school to take master's level accounting courses to take over the business after my grandfather became sick. Um, I was not very observant, so I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I can tell you that I picked up tons of things, but I will tell you this. When I said to you, think about the relationship your family has with your business, it's true. My mom became the office manager for my dad when he owned, he owned a medical practice before he went to do uh, research for a large pharmaceutical company. And so she had four young children. She's trying to balance that, and she's trying to be the office manager. Uh, there were some really tough moments when money was really tight for them. Really, really, really tight. Uh, that's common for people. Uh, it's, so I've, in ways, I suppose I could tell you that I've lived through it. Uh, and in other ways, I would tell you I was kind of naive to it. I don't know why it took me so long to figure out that I came from a family of entrepreneurs, but all of these things that I'm telling you are real. Uh, and I can tell you this, you can come out of it and it can be the best experience you've ever had. I have never been happier than I am today owning my own business. I have never grown more. I have never learned more. I have never been more challenged. I have never loved my clients more. I love my clients. I love the work that I'm doing with them. It is fantastic. And, and it's been a great match for me, but it's not, it's not a perfect match for everybody. So it's actually all part of the package, actually. So my MPA focused on leadership and management, including management in nonprofits. And when I left, I was really fascinated at looking at 
what makes programs work? What really makes a company work? And how can you figure out if things aren't going well? And so I spent about six and a half years diagnosing what's going wrong actually in government. And I will tell you, there is never a better training opportunity than figuring out what's going wrong <laughs> than working in government. And as part of that, I also did training. So I trained internally. When I left them, I shifted into what's called an organization development role, and it really allowed me to use all of these skills I had been using in the past, and I focused on leader development. Part of leader development is coaching, and not coaching from the perspective of, you're a problem child, but coaching from the perspective of, you're doing really well. Companies like Google, uh, there's a couple of other tech firms, I think uh, Twitter, um, and, and I'd have to check on that, but there's a number of tech firms that have started bringing in coaches for new leaders to really give them the support that they need to develop. And so that was just part of my job. It's, it's really a natural fit. Um, and, and I love that because it's part of providing a complete support network for, for leader development. Thanks. Thank you.